Okay, okay we need to bring up the orange mic, if you would, please. Can you hear me? No? Are you going to sit? I don't know. <laughs> well, decide, and then we know where to put the mic. No, all right, I'll, come I'll stand up, I guess. Doris can stand up, I guess I can stand up. So. Um, my name is David Burke, and I was raised, uh, my parents were raised in Mormonism. Um, <clears throat> they loved, the church was everything to them. They lived the church, they taught the church, they, uh, it was their life. Um, I, did, I was born in Salt Lake City, and I was, uh, at the age of seven, they moved, and when we left uh, the ward house down there in Salt Lake, um, my mom had prepared to talk to me, and and that was my testimony of, of the gospel at age seven. I had that, no absolutely no idea what I was talking about, but she had done a really thorough job on raising me um, to believe the, what Mormonism taught. Uh, I've had a few discussions with her in the, in the recently, and she said, oh, I wish I would have done a better job. And I said, Mom, you did a fantastic job raising me a Mormon. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would still probably be there. But uh, we moved up here when I was seven years old um, to Pinesdale. They had uh, uh, been reading a little bit in the Mormon older scriptures, uh, the early, like Doris was talking about, the early more, the presidents and, and prophets of the church. And there was a lot of changes that had taken place from the current Mormon church to the old Mormon, to the original church. And so they thought that maybe uh, they were need, they needed to live all the laws. And so they... Um, ended up finding the AUB group. Um, uh, Rulon Allred was the prophet of that group at that time, and he was a very charismatic man, and he encouraged them and talked them into leaving. So uh, they moved to Pinesdale. One of the, the principles that they believed in at the time was um, a united order where you would turn over everything you had. So when my dad and mom moved up there. My dad pulled out his retirement fund and gave it to the church. And uh, they lived on, a, on a, a budget. The church up there had a budget where a man would get uh, so much money for him and his wife and the children. And uh, <clears throat> each child would get so much. And it was like not very much. I think our family lived on for years and years and years. We lived like on $300 a month. And uh, it was... We never went out to eat. We never bought new clothes. We never went anywhere. We had no money for anything. But if you had a big family, there was money because there was lots of kids usually, and uh, so it worked out pretty good for the big families. Um, I, as I was growing up, I, um, I loved, I loved the, the Mormon gospel. I, um, you, if you remember back in. I think it was the early, late 70s that uh, they had the Jonestown um, deal down there and, and the Kool-Aid situation, and that's kind of what I refer my life to. I just love the Kool-Aid. I mean, just give me another cup of that stuff. I couldn't wait to get more. I uh, thought I was a, a real righteous person. I remember you're always being looking for someone who could just live it a little bit better than somebody else, you know, and, and that's why there's so many groups that come off. You know, you'll get one group that will start, and then they'll... Get another group that'll come out of there saying, "Well, they aren't doing this, so we all need to go do this." And it was, uh, but I, I found a man that I, I thought I was very impressed with. I, I was admired him. He was my hero, and I, um, <clears throat> I just believed that he was, he was the man. And so, I, uh, <laughs> I put my trust and faith and hope in him, and it ended up being not working out too well. Um, I ended up finding out that he was just a man, and. Uh, it was quite a, a crushing experience for me, but there was a real eye-opening experience in that that I learned that uh, I'm not trusting men anymore. Um, I, uh, we have, uh, me and my wife have uh, five children. Our second to the youngest is, uh, our son has autism, and he was born, and when he was born, our, my wife especially, she kind of quit going to church. Uh, and she started staying home because it was really hard to take a, her to take our boy to church. And she had also been reading and studying, and she had come to the conclusion that Mormonism wasn't all that it's cracked up to be. 
And so it took me a long time to, um, to come out of it. She was very easy about not pushing me, but it was years and years and years. And finally, I just gradually quit going. I <clears throat> was building a house out in the valley, um, and the guy that's building a house says, why don't you come and go to the Christian church I go to? And I says, well, okay. I wasn't involved too much in, uh, in the church up there, and I wasn't really afraid of the Christian church, but I came, I came here. He brought me here to this church. And I came and I, for me, and I, I think it's, I, I don't have the experience that Doris and Karen had in polygamy, but I have, you were, I was still stuck, I was still trapped in, in Mormonism, the deception and the lies were very strong in my life. And when I came here and they, this church believes the Bible, and uh, well, I believe the Bible. Kind of, and uh, but we have all these other scriptures too. And, and I came, and there was a lot of singing. It was different. I'd never been to a Christian church before, and I, I think I came for like four weeks or something like that. And and I couldn't understand it. I didn't get it. I didn't. Nothing happened for me here. I uh, I remember going back, and and the pastor here at the time was was Pastor Kelly, and he ended up calling my workplace and wanted to check on me and see how I was doing, and if there's anything you could do. And that was really strange because I'd never ever had anybody in that faith do anything like that for me before. Um, <clears throat> so we ended up uh, leaving Pinesdale and moving into the house that was being built for us. I uh, went, I had a sister that died in <clears throat> Salt Lake and we went down there, hurt my uh, wife's parents, her, her dad is in the LDS church and he says, why don't you come on back? And I said, well, I, I will if my wife would, but my wife wasn't interested and I wasn't interested in going back by myself. It was, for me, it was too hard of a situation to try and work with, to go by myself to church without the support of my wife. So I said, and I told my wife that. She says, don't ever say that to my dad again. You know, put all this pressure on me to come back. And I said, I'm sorry, I won't do that anymore. <laughs> and so I, I, but I wanted to, you know, I had read some things, I'd seen some things on the internet. And so I started looking a little bit, you know, I thought, well, this is a pretty good place. I'm, I'm not really in the church. But I kind of really want to know what Mormonism teaches. I'd seen a, a website, kind of she, Doris hinted to a little bit about Joel Smith's 34 Wives. And, and there was a website that I'd seen that was, at the time was called Joel Smith's Forgotten Wives. And so I went there and I read that. <clears throat> I believe it's put out by a member of the church. But there's all the wives are dated on the date they're married, um, at their age they're married. Uh, they were kind of evenly divided. There was, I think, 11 or something that were about his age. There was 11 of them that were currently married to a member in the church. And I didn't have a problem with them playing me because I came from Pinesdale, but I had a problem with marrying somebody else's wife while she was still married to her husband. That was a problem for me. Um, and then the, the young girls was a problem for me, those that were way younger than her than him and, and Helmar Kimball was a really problem for me <laughs> because I had a problem with coming out of those situations where you believe that the prophet that you're believing in is the spokesman of God and when they use that power and authority to pressurize people into doing things that's really bad. I mean I really had a problem with that um, and so when he went to her and you know promised her this stuff it was and then he didn't give her any time. He, she had to make a decision now. And uh, it was just a, and that's a, the way he worked on a lot of them. And I, so I read that, and then I was looking for a book to read <clears throat> on early Mormon history. And, because I'd read the, his, the Mormon history, but it was according to the church. It was the church's view of Mormon history. And I said, like, well, I just want what really happened, and then I'll decide. I don't want something that's really out there that's trying to bash the church. But just give me the facts. And so I found a book called uh, No Man Knows My History by Farm Brody. And I read that book and I, and I started seeing that there's problems here. Um, I, uh, <laughs> there is a, for, for, I guess you have to understand as a Mormon and the way you're taught and if you never read the Bible, there's a lot of claims of Mormonism claims that are, are pretty strong if you don't know the truth. And so, I had all these claims I was trying to deal with, but once I started reading this book, and I go through it, it's all documented. There's, 
the early history of, of, the, of the, what happened and, you know, what, when they would go into a town, in a, in a state and, and, you know, it sounds like they were the underdogs, but in that reality, they were actually trying to take over and, and to push the people out. And it, you never hear that, but that's kind of what uh, I started reading. And I started reading about, like, Joseph Smith, you know, he has the, the supposed vision of God the Father and the Son. And then you start seeing all these discrepancies, and, and it's just one thing after another. And I've heard people talk about it, like you're somebody pulled a plug, and all the sand starts to go down the hole. And it just and for me, after I read that book, I was done. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Mormons were dead to me, <clears throat> and I was never going back there. Um, but I thought I thought I was a pretty good person. Um, at work, sometimes there would be a, some somebody who's at work, and they would have a, on a, a Christian station. And I remember hearing a pastor talking, and where he'd read like three or four verses out of the Bible, and then he'd spend like an hour expounding that. And I had never ever heard that in my all my time in Mormonism. I've never heard the Bible preached. I've never heard it explained like this was explained. Um, I I was kind of to the point that I thought. I was pretty content with my life. I, I had gone to the Christian church. I didn't get it. I was done with Mormonism. I thought I was a good person. Um, and so I was just, I was content with my life of sin. I didn't think I was that bad because, I mean, in the, let's see here, from this, because this verse explains pretty good. It says uh, in 2 Corinthians, it says, but when they measure themselves by another and compare themselves, with one another, they are without understanding. And that's where I was. I thought that because I wasn't guilty of sins that somebody else may have done, that I was better, I was okay. In reality, I was I was not okay. And um, because of that, I, let's see. Another kind of interesting uh, thing that happened in my life, just, just some highlights maybe that what kind of affected me. Um, we had an employee that worked for me back in the time, and, and he seen I was having a hard time, a hard day, and he's a Christian, he says, can I pray for you? And that was strange, because Mormons never pray for people like that. And he, you know, and that was just, it was one of those things that didn't change, but it was a seed that was planted. It was something that happened that I seen that there's something different in that kind of, in that person. Um, on uh, July 7th, in 2014, I just woke up and, Something had happened in my life. I don't know how to explain it other than there's this feeling. And Mormons are based on feelings, you know, they have these feelings. But there's a feeling of love and peace that came into my heart that day. And I, I don't know, I couldn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. I remember calling the guy that brought me to church. I says, what's the name of that church? I think the pastor's name. I says, I gotta call him. He says, well, what's wrong? He says, you getting a divorce or something? I said, no, I, I, God's doing something in my life and I don't know what it is. And uh, I want to talk to him. Uh, I called Glenn. He was the pastor of the church at that time. And he says, uh, I says, I want to meet you. He says, well, where do you want to meet? And I says, I don't care. He says, you want to meet? I says, let's just meet at your church. And he says, okay. Do you care if I bring somebody? And I says, no. And so he brought Mike Kidder, who was a missionary for the church at the time, with me, and he's on a furlough or something. And so they came, and I, I remember coming into the church, and I, he says, I, I just need to talk to somebody. Something is going on in my life. I have no idea what is going on, but something is going on. I'm not, I'm not going back to the Mormon. I can't go to Mormonism. But God's doing something. And, and I, I, I shared with you kind of what I come from and what was going on, my, my background. And I says, you know, I need... I remember my raised on the... the a King James Bible, and for me it was hard to understand the King James Bible. I know a lot of people love it, and that's good, but for me it was hard. And so he gave me the Bible. I says, you have a Bible that I can read? And he said, yeah. And I got the Bible still. I love my Bible. I almost lost it once, and it freaked me out. But, I, I but God put a desire in me for, for reading his word and for trusting, and it's amazing how, and I think that's one of the most damnable things that Joseph Smith taught, is that the Bible cannot be trusted. And I realized why he did it, because if I would have just read the Bible, I would have come to Christ. Because it, it just absolutely just demolishes. They talk about 
that uh, the Book of Mormon and the Bible are, they're, are uh, you know, two witnesses. They're not the same. I mean, they're just totally in opposition to one another. Everything that the church claims can be disproved by the Bible. But I started reading the Bible. Um, I wanted to go to church. I This is weird because... I hadn't gone to church for years, and all of a sudden I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be where believers were. And my wife had a cleaning job on Sunday, and I, I went with you on Wednesday, I think it was. And Sunday I wanted to come to church so bad, and uh, <laughs> and my wife had this job, and I says, um, I'll help you anytime during the day, but I'm going to go to church on Sunday, and I'll help you clean before or after or something. So I, since then I've, I've been coming to church, and... And I, I needed that. I, I don't know what it is. There's an attraction. I mean, even when you go, when I go on trips and stuff, I've had a chance. I just want to find a church to go. It's, a, it's an instant bond. I mean, it's like they don't. Even, they're not even the same denomination or whatever. But if the Bible's taught there, if the power of God's there, you're that's your family. That's who that is. Um, so I started reading the Bible and go to church, and somehow I found Christian music. I don't know how it came, but I just. I would. I had a job where I could listen to my phone, and I would just I would listen to these new Christian songs that I had never heard before. Person, I find myself crying, and the, you know, it's just an amazing, an amazing thing that God was doing in my life. I remember when I when I came in that with Glenn. I, uh, I says, I don't know if I told you this, but I says, I'm gonna watch you. I don't know why I want to see because I coming from a cult and being deceived so bad, the guards are up. I mean, mm -hmm. you're just scared. I was. I was scared to death. I didn't know who I could trust. I didn't know. Uh, I mean, so I'm going to watch you. I'm going to make sure you're preaching. And I, <laughs> when I realized that I was so ignorant of the Bible, <laughs> I couldn't watch anybody <laughs> or know if they're teaching the truth or not. <laughs> but I did. <clears throat> I did, uh, I had raised, I've been raised around Christians. I mean, we had some rubbings and stuff, but I never ever had a Christian share the gospel with me. My whole life, up to 49 years old, no one ever shared me the good news of the gospel. And uh, I heard them talk about going uh, church shopping where they would try and go find a church. And, and I didn't know, I didn't know what, how to find a church and all. But uh, I had listened to this pastor that I listened to on the radio. His name was Alistair Begg. And uh, he, he said that when his family would go on vacation, that uh, his dad would look for a church to go to on that Sunday. And, and he asked his dad, so how do I know what a good church, how do you know what a good church is? And he says, a church that uh, teaches the Bible, teaches from the Bible, and a church that has a prayer meeting at least once a week. And, and this church followed into that category of so and I just felt like God just stuck me here. I mean, I'd have, I probably could have had other opportunities to go somewhere else, but I wanted to. He just put me here. I felt like I needed to be where he had placed me. Um, at that time, when I was saved, I was addicted to pornography. And that day that God saved me, that addiction was gone. I had, I had some pretty serious back problems where my back would go out almost all the time, my lower back. And I have only, I think, had one episode where I've had back problems since God saved me, and that only lasted for a day. Um, he would wake me up at night, and I'd spend time with him in prayer and in his word. And uh, he was just, it was just an amazing thing. It was like, and I've heard, a, I've heard uh, a pastor kind of talk about this, but it was like a honeymoon season for me, where all, I, I was just so full of love, and I just wanted him. I just was immersed in who he was. I, I, uh, I started listening to Alistair Begg, and uh, there's so much out there that you, there's available, and, and I didn't know who I could trust, but I, I believed that I could trust him, and then I would associate. He'd go to a conference or something, and there would be other speakers there, and I said, well, if he's there, I probably can trust this person. And uh, so I, I just, and God just took me. He took me through a time of just listening to the Word, to uh, listening to preaching of his word, and it was just a, a miracle in my life. And uh, I thought I remember thinking that I had to be able to forsake Mormonism, Mormonism before God could 
save me. Or there's something, there's some kind of a tie. They're not realizing that it's his grace that he gives as a gift. And he believes through faith and in his grace, and that's how I'm saved. It, it, you know, it's a time, it's a time of growing and, and maturing in, in, in the gospel. Um, I have maybe one more, a couple more things here to share, and then I'll be done. But um, the feeling that I had, I remember, I remember the day it left, and uh, it was, it was hard, but I knew by then I knew that my life wasn't based on feelings, and I knew that from my Mormonism. But it was just, but I could trust God. For his word, and a lot of times, like this, I was saying, this uh, pastor was saying, you know, there's a, there's like a honeymoon period, and then God withdraws a little bit to show you the great need you have to trust in Him and to rest in Him, yeah. and to, uh, and to even if He's not, you can't feel Him. His word says that I will never leave you or forsake you, and you can trust that. Um, I have one more thing I want to share, and I'll probably be done, but. Um, <clears throat> I had a really difficult time in my life, probably a few years after this, and uh, it was a, a lot of conflict in my life. I was really broken. I couldn't eat. I, uh, I couldn't find rest anywhere. Um, I was getting a lot of uh, resistance from my wife and uh, my partner in work, and I just, you know, before I would have says, if this is the way you're going to treat me, God, I'm done. But God has a way of working in your life where when those times come, you just fall on your face. You call out to God and you say, God, you help me. And he did. And uh, he doesn't help you in the way you would expect him to help you. <laughs> but he helps you. And, and as I was calling out to God, um, my wife got sick and almost died. And that took away that pressure that was there on my life. But I have to share this verse because this is where he, I was reading the Bible and, and this is where he took me in. Um, but he says, he took me to Second Chronicles 19, chapter 20, and it says in here that then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast for all Judea and to seek the help from God. And it says here that uh, he, and he said to God, for we are powerless against this great horde that is contending against us. We are not, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And uh, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And that's, I just, you know, you just have to trust God, and, uh, and that's what He did. I mean, I've, I've, my wife is not a believer. I don't think there's anybody in my family that's a believer. But God is faithful. I mean, if He wasn't faithful, I, I'm the last thing I have is I'm amazed at God's grace for me. I, there's a, I think one of the big differences, and uh, God's faithful to keep those so many calls. But one of the biggest things for me is when I was raised a Mormon, the cross was a terrible, terrible thing. It was a sign of pain and suffering, a sign of cruelty that Christ had to endure. It wasn't, it wasn't a sign of grace. It wasn't a sign of how great his love was for me. And uh, now I, do, I love the cross. I love what it shows. I love that grace. I love the I love that sacrifice that he died for me. He died, he went to the cross for me. It wasn't for the sins of everyone. For all those who believe it is, but, I, but it's a personal relationship with me and, and what he's done for me. And I just, uh, God is good. God is good, he's faithful. I, I uh, have a real testimony of prayer. I believe prayer is a powerful, powerful tool that we don't take enough advantage of. And God does great things. I just, and you know, and the word says that we have not because we ask not. Let's ask for big things. And I, I, <laughs> we have a prayer meeting um, on Wednesday, and, and we've been praying for Pinesdale. And <laughs> I pray for a, a church to be planted, a Christian church to be planted there, and for a pastor and leaders. And 
and people to come to faith there. Glenn said, we need to put bigger than that, you know. And, you know, he's right. right? And, you know, we want the whole community That's right. there. So, in concluding, I just want to pray. You know, we, I don't know how to be done, but Lord, I just thank you for, I thank you for your grace. I thank you, to, thank you that it is more powerful, more has the ability to draw, Father. I thank you that when we are sinners, dead in our sins and trespasses, that you saved us, that you, at the right time, you brought Christ to die for our sin, God. I thank you for the good news of the gospel, that you placed our sins upon Christ, and they were nailed to the cross. And in exchange for our, taking our sins, he gives us your righteousness, that righteousness that we do not have to work for, that is a free gift from God. I just thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray your blessings upon Doris and, and this ministry that she's see, you brought her into. And the, desires her to, uh, to labor in, in bringing the light into these dark areas. God, and I pray that you would enable her, that you'd open up doors and, and uh, avenues that she could go and do a great work. And I pray that uh, even for Pinesdale, Lord, your word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And I, God, I just ask that you would take your church and prevail against those gates that are there. There's, there's deception, there's lies, there's... Um, Change to bind those people, God, and I ask that you break them. I break, ask you that your spirit would go in there in a powerful way and just free those people, Lord. And I ask that you would do it all over this country, wherever these these um, strongholds of Satan are, God, that you would bring your people to break down those strongholds. Your, your word says that you're, the Satan's gates cannot stand against them, and, and your word is powerful, more powerful than to a sword, Father. I pray for these things, even now, that you would just do a work, Father, that you would stimulate your people to go. That you, I just thank you for the many that are being saved out of Mormonism and out of polygamy, God. That they're, everywhere we look, we see people being saved out of there. And I just ask that they be a light, that you would make them bold for you. And that the, they would, it would shine in those areas. And just give us strength, give us boldness, and help us to proclaim the truth in love. And just give us a heart for these people, Lord. And I was there. And God, without your grace, without your power in my life, I would still be lost. And I just praise you for that. I just thank you for bringing us together this day. And I just praise you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, I ask.